Our second talk is also about galaxies, if we accept the broad definition of the last talk as being about galaxies. And uh, this one is actually more about galaxies themselves. It will be given to you by my colleague, the wonderful Grace Tucker. Join me in welcoming Grace, who is a PhD student at the University of Washington. <laughs> This is an awesome crowd. Um, so, following up on Jen's talk, I am here to basically take you through all the other kinds of galaxies that exist in our universe. Um, this is my research field. This is the stuff I'm really passionate about, so I'm really excited to share this with you. So, I say a whirlwind tour of galaxies because people teach entire classes about this, and I'm going to hit the highlight reel in the next 20 minutes or so. So, get ready. <laughs> So, before I even start my talk, I want to point out this image that I have here. I have galaxified my title slide using writing.galaxystudio.org. So, <laughs> this is actually uh, generated using images from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and people have found these images using Galaxy Zoo, which is a citizen science tool and I wanted to advertise this to you because I feel like if you're here with me on your Wednesday night drinking beer and hearing about galaxies, you might be into this. So <laughs> you can actually log into this website and help scientists achieve their science goals by classifying images. Because human eyes, let's face it, they're just better than computers. No matter what algorithms we write, sometimes it's just better to have humans look at stuff. So, you can classify galaxies based on their shapes and help people do really interesting science that leads to some of the results I'm going to share with you tonight, which is awesome. And if galaxies aren't really your thing, you can classify all kinds of other stuff, like planets and penguins and cyclones. There's tons of stuff on zooniverse.org, so here's just a plug for that. Check it out if you're interested. So, back to my actual talk. If you... We're a Mac owner, circa 2011. This is gonna look really familiar to you. This is your desktop background. <laughs> this is a galaxy in our galactic neighborhood. This is M31, um, or Andromeda. This galaxy basically looks like the Milky Way. It's a little bit bigger, but otherwise it's basically the same thing. I'm gonna bet that this image is basically what comes to your mind, and mine actually, when you hear the word galaxy. This is pretty typical. So. This galaxy is sitting in a big dark matter halo, like all galaxies are. This is just most of the mass in galaxies, but it doesn't actually emit any light, but it's there. This galaxy has a nice disk structure. It's got something like 100 billion stars. It's forming new stars, but at a pretty low and slow, steady rate. So this is like a pretty typical galaxy for our part of the universe. So my job tonight is to basically show you all the things that are galaxies that don't really look like this, okay? So to do this, I'm gonna go through a bunch of different ways that we classify galaxies and a bunch of different, I don't know, categories that we put galaxies in. I'm gonna show you the span of galaxies across each of these categories. So first up, we have the stellar mass or brightness of a galaxy. Basically, the more stars a galaxy has, the brighter it is. So We'll see galaxies cover a wide range in these properties. We have morphology, or the shape of galaxies. So you see my very elegant spiral arms there, or they can look pretty much just like blobs. Um, we also have the star formation rate, so how quickly galaxies are building up new stars on top of the ones they already have. And we have something called nuclear activity. So most galaxies host black holes, supermassive black holes at their centers. Um, and basically sometimes these black holes eat a lot of gas really quickly and then they blow out a whole bunch of energy. And so that's what these little jets are, that's nuclear activity, we'll circle back to this later. Okay, and feel free to interrupt with questions by the way, throwing that out there. So, galaxies cover a huge range in stellar mass. They are not all basically the same size by a long shot. So we have our Milky Way-like typical galaxy here. Um, these galaxies, uh, they're fairly common. Basically, if you try to make a galaxy much bigger than that, they become a lot less common. It turns out it's really hard to make galaxies that are much bigger than our Milky Way. 
Um, so at the very, very massive end, you have galaxies that are something like 10 times more massive in terms of their stellar content. And at the other extreme, sorry, I didn't hear you. That, that wasn't a question. Okay, so <laughs> at the other extreme, you have these dwarf galaxies, which are extremely common relative to more massive galaxies. Um, and a dwarf galaxy is something that is at least 100 times less massive than our Milky Way. It can be much more, or much less massive than that, actually. So we could really draw this line way off this plot, but that wouldn't be a very interesting plot to look at. So, dwarf galaxies, here's your general picture. And I just want to emphasize that this is just kind of the most well understood part of the galaxy population, and this is, you know, a thousand times difference in stellar mass. So this is a pretty wide range we're talking about here. So at the very, very small extreme end, we have ultra-faint dwarf galaxies. In this image I'm showing you, there is a galaxy called Boots 1. Does anybody think they can point to that galaxy? Tell me where to put my laser pointer. Up. Up? Up here? Down? Down? Up? Up? Okay, okay. So this galaxy is actually filling basically this entire image. You just can't see the contours outside of it with your naked eye because there are so few stars in this galaxy, you cannot pick it out by eye. Um, this is a satellite galaxy of our Milky Way, and all ultra-faint dwarf galaxies that we know of are Milky Way satellites because they are so faint, you literally cannot detect them far away from our galaxy. So essentially what astronomers had to do is measure the individual stars in this image, do some kind of modeling to figure out which ones belong to our galaxy that are actually in the foreground, get rid of those, and then pick out just the stars that belong to this ultra faint dwarf and do science with that. So these are very, very tricky little tiny galaxies. <laughs> this you find a galaxy? So, what I just said, basically you measure all the stars and you model out the ones that are in the foreground. I mean, really, that's the only way you can do it, because you can't just say by eye, oh, there's a galaxy in this image. You need to use, you know, detailed measurements of the stars to figure out which ones are part of the dwarf and which ones are part of the Milky Way. Does that make sense? <laughs> kind of. Okay. <laughs> So this galaxy has a brightness that's something like 10,000 times the brightness of our sun. For reference, that is something like a million times fainter than our Milky Way galaxy. So this thing is really, really faint. Okay. So this is just kind of a fun oddball class of galaxies. These are ultra diffuse galaxies. So you can kind of see the galaxy in this image. It's this sort of fuzzy blob in the middle. So that is a galaxy. This is in a galaxy cluster, and essentially it is the same physical size, you know, diameter across as our Milky Way galaxy, but it has a hundred times fewer stars. So it's much, much less massive, and it's actually basically held together gravitationally by its dark matter. So these galaxies are actually a pretty recent discovery. The paper that I took this from came out in 2015, and this was sort of the discovery paper. So this is kind of an open area of research. It's pretty hard to explain how to form these weirdo galaxies that are not very massive at all, but huge. All right. And then at the very, very large extreme of the galaxy spectrum, I suppose, we have brightest cluster galaxies. So this image is of a galaxy cluster. Basically, there is a ton of mass in this structure. Um, it's mostly dark matter, and the amount of matter here is so great that it's bending the light from the galaxies in the background. So that's what these streaks are in the image. It's basically distorted light that's caused by space actually being bent by the mass that's in this galaxy cluster. And so, this galaxy in the middle is the brightest cluster galaxy, and it's essentially been sitting there at the middle of this huge galaxy cluster, eating up other galaxies as they make their way into the center. And so through this process of merging with smaller galaxies, it can become very, very massive in terms of its stellar content. So this is basically how you form the very, very brightest and biggest galaxies in the universe. Question? Yeah. Does that sooner or later be so there is definitely a supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy. 
Yeah, and as that galaxy eats smaller galaxies, their supermassive black holes will also you know, spiral it. Yeah, yeah. What kind of telescope was that job with? That was almost certainly a Hubble Space Telescope image. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, galaxies do not just, you know, form and then stay as they are. I've sort of alluded to this, but galaxies are doing things. They are constantly changing. So, the basic thing that galaxies do is accrete gas and turn that gas into stars. And by accretion, I mean there's gas in between galaxies. We call this the intergalactic medium. And basically, this gas will flow into galaxies along these sort of filament-like structures and kind of settle into the middle of the galaxy. And once it's there, it can continue to condense and eventually form stars. So that's basically what galaxies are. They're star-making machines. And as this star formation progresses, the young stars will explode as supernovae. And they inject a whole bunch of energy back into the gas within the galaxy and essentially drive a lot of that gas back out. So galaxies are surprisingly dynamical places. And all these processes of star formation and the associated gas flows, this will continue as long as there is this gas supply available to fuel star formation. We actually see a lot of galaxies in the universe that are quenched, which is astronomers speak for no longer forming stars. Uh, we also call them red and dead. And we'll circle back to this in a moment. Okay, so this leads me into the idea of galaxy morphology. So, morphology is just the shape of a galaxy. This is the basic spread of galaxy shapes that we see. Over here, we have elliptical galaxies, designated with E's, very creatively. And over here, we have spiral galaxies, designated as S's. This top branch is just regular old spirals with sort of a bulge component, and the bottom branch here has bar structures. And then over here, we have irregular galaxies, which are exactly that. They just look kind of irregular. They don't look like other galaxies, and so they get their own special category over here. So you might recognize this name of the diagram, the Hubble Tuning Fork, same name as the very famous telescope, but the diagram was not named for the telescope. It was named for the man, Edwin Hubble, who came up with this diagram as part of his sort of first theory of you know, galaxy evolution back in 1926. So this is a very old idea. Um, so there's this idea that some evolution happens. One side of this diagram turns into the other side of the diagram. Which way do you think the direction of evolution goes? Are we going from left to right or from right to left? Right to left, yes. <laughs> yes, so this is true. This is what we understand to be true today. However, back in the day when Hubble first made this diagram, he thought that it went from left to right. And because astronomers really hate giving up our historical jargon, to this day, these galaxies are referred to as early type galaxies, and these are late type galaxies. <laughs> Not kidding at all. This is the jargon. <laughs> so. <laughs> so, modern understanding is that, generally speaking, things on the right of this diagram turn into things on the left of this diagram. So things over here are blue galaxies, which you can see just by looking at them. The blue light is due to the sort of bluer light that is output by young, short-lived stars. So if you don't have recently formed stars, your galaxy's not going to look blue. Um, they have a lot of gas, and they're still forming their stars. Over here, the elliptical galaxies, in general, tend to be pretty massive. They tend to have this red color because they don't have any new stars because they are quenched. So... Okay, we have blue and we have red. Think about the rainbow. We have, oh, yeah, question? Uh, the IRR, the irregular. Uh -huh. Do you have any, any criteria in terms of which one? Which, 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 which. Um, so irregulars tend to be very, very small galaxies. They're typically dwarf galaxies, and so they're still, they're still forming stars. They will probably sort of join the sequence at some point later as they continue to build up, they're at a very early evolutionary stage. Um, it's hard to tell. Yeah. <laughs> you can't predict the future, I guess. Um, so we have our blue galaxies and our red galaxies, but we're missing orange, yellow, and green, right? So where are those other colors? Oh, sorry. Yes. So this transition happens, but it's really unclear 
why. It's still an active area of research. People have a lot of good ideas, but it's not a solved mystery. And there are probably a lot of different pathways for this to happen. So just keep that in mind. I'm very clear about the generic statements, but in detail, this is probably not how everything works in a very smooth way. So in between the red and the blue, where are the green galaxies? So another way to think about this color dichotomy is in terms of the amount of star formation that's going on. So most galaxies in the universe live in one of these two clumps. We have the quenched red galaxies down here, not forming a lot of stars, and then we have this sequence of bluer galaxies that are still forming their stars. But there are some galaxies populating other parts of this diagram. We do, in fact, have some green galaxies, although they don't look green. If you find a picture of a galaxy, it doesn't actually look green to your eye. We just say green because it's in between red and blue. Um, and then we also have these starburst galaxies up here. And so there are very few galaxies in these two parts of the diagram. We basically call these transient populations because they don't really stick around in these parts of the diagram for too long. And I will talk a little bit about both of these categories right now. So first up, we have our starburst galaxies. So these are star-forming galaxies that have somehow recently come into a whole bunch of gas that they didn't have available to them before. And so they have the ability to form stars at a very, very high rate relative to sort of the normal amount of star formation for a galaxy of its size. And as a result, you have a lot of these massive young stars that are dying and exploding as supernovae and injecting a lot of energy into the gas. And so this image is showing you these outflows of gas coming out of the galaxy because there's just so much star formation happening that it can essentially evacuate the gas from the galaxy. And so these objects are short-lived and they do not hang out in the starburst area of that diagram because they essentially exhaust their gas supply very, very quickly and will fall back down to sort of more normal star formation rates. Yeah. Could you describe the time frames you're talking about? Like when you say yeah, you okay, break great point. Something? Yes, so short in terms of astronomical time scales is something like 100 million years <laughs> up to a billion years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you can tell I've been spending too much time thinking about galaxies. This is my concept of short. <laughs> okay, and so then we have the Green Valley galaxies, which we do think are a transition population. So what I'm showing you here is basically that same diagram except with real data, but this time it's flipped. So now things at the bottom are forming fewer stars, or I'm sorry, things at the bottom are forming a lot of stars, things at the top are not forming stars. And this is basically a contour map showing the number of galaxies. So there are a lot of galaxies right here and a lot of galaxies right here and not very much in between. And so we have our red galaxies up here, blue here, not much in what we call the Green Valley. And the idea is that galaxies are hanging out in this star-forming portion of the diagram, but then they quench for some reason. And they move relatively quickly, again, in astronomy terms, a few hundred million years to a gig year, move relatively quickly through the Green Valley and make their way over to this quench population. And so that's the explanation for why we don't see a lot of galaxies in that part of the diagram. Things just move through there relatively quickly. So, there are probably a lot of mechanisms at play in that transition, and it's probably different for different kinds of galaxies, but one really promising idea about how this works is, at least for some galaxies, an active galactic nucleus probably plays a big role in the quenching process. So, I briefly referenced this at the beginning, just to refresh your memory. Most galaxies have a supermassive black hole at the center. If there is a gas supply available to that black hole, the gas will accrete onto the black hole, and it turns out that this process just produces a lot of energy. And so these jets form, a lot of energy is injected back into the galaxy, and things happen, like these huge winds that you see here. And just to make it very clear, this black hole is tiny. The accretion disk is tiny. So on the scale of the galaxy, all of this energetic stuff is happening at the very, very center. But we think that these objects still have a really big effect across the entire galaxy. It's not just affecting things at the very center. And so it turns out that AGN hosting galaxies are preferentially Green Valley galaxies. 
again, this is not a cut and dry thing. We do see AGN in both red and blue galaxies, but preferentially they hang out in the Green Valley. So this is a general story that kind of ties together this idea of active galactic nuclei and starburst galaxies and quenching all in one neat picture. So for at least some kinds of galaxies, this is probably what's going on. So we have a merger between two you know, normal star-forming gas-rich galaxies. This merger basically causes gas to funnel to the center of the galaxy, feed the black hole, and simultaneously feed star formation. The same gas sources both of these processes. And all of this produces a lot of feedback, which essentially makes the gas no longer available for star formation causes the galaxy to quench, and then you're left with your transition Green Valley galaxy, and then eventually a quenched elliptical galaxy. So this is the broad picture of how quenching works. And best for last, of course, we have galaxy mergers. So this makes it very clear sort of how dramatic these big events are. So these are major mergers, and major means that the two galaxies that are merging are kind of similar in their stellar mass. So rather than just being kind of a boring little galaxy kind of being absorbed into a bigger one, and you get these huge like cosmic train wreck kind of mergers. And so basically the gravitational forces are huge, you get stars being flung out of the galaxies, um, these same gravitational forces are causing gas to get funneled into the center and sort of compressed and it triggers star formation. So in this image here, all the pink is tracing ongoing recent star formation. So mergers are just fantastic things to have images of. Thank you, Hubble Space Telescope, again. And just to bring this closer to home, our galaxy is definitely going to undergo a merger like this in about four billion years. So we have our friend Andromeda, remember from one of the very first slides, Andromeda looks like this, roughly, in the sky now. <laughs> As time goes on, it's going to start looking bigger and looming bigger, and then that's going to happen when our two galaxies finally collide and rip each other apart, and then they're going to go through the process of kind of settling down and then being a really boring, quenched, red elliptical galaxy. <laughs> So, we have that to look forward to, but as Jen told us in her talk, the Earth is going to be roasted by then, by our expanding sun. So, we won't even be here to witness this epic night scene. So, I will leave you on this very happy note. Thank you all so much. We have time for a bunch of questions. So the question is, let's say we were able to find another planet or another solar system to go inhabit before our planet is killed. Would we be able to survive this event? That is, are all solar systems going to be destroyed when this kind of merger happens? And the answer is, we would probably be fine as long as we found a planet that was far enough away from its star to survive the effects of the stellar evolution. If we could find a happy place to hang out, individual stars are not going to be destroyed by this. There's actually a lot of space in between stars, so the probability of star-star collisions is actually quite small. Um, I don't know as much about you know potential gravitational effects winging planets out of solar systems, but that seems kind of unlikely to me. I think you would probably be fine. Yeah. I think what you're talking about is Yeah, yeah. So the question is, what makes these really diffuse galaxies a galaxy as opposed to just a random collection of stars hanging out somewhere? So the basic idea is that these stars are all living in a dark matter halo, and they're all gravitationally bound together. So that's really the definition of a galaxy. It's a gravitationally bound system of stars, gas, dark matter, dust, things like that. 
Um, so basically, based on measuring how the stars are moving, you can figure out how much mass must be present in that galaxy. And it turns out that for those very ultra-faint dwarfs, they're actually heavily dominated by the dark matter component. So that's what's keeping everything together, and that's what makes it a galaxy. Yes. Any other questions? timeline between these images. I didn't super do my homework. I added the slide at the last minute. I don't actually know. <laughs> Sorry. Indeed. Honesty here. Yeah. Yeah. Rotational motion. 
Um, I think that observations of, say, galaxy cluster mergers uh, support the evidence, or sorry, support the theory of dark matter that we have. Does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah. That's a really good question. Question is, do all black holes form in galaxies? I'm going to venture a guess um, just because I think, OK, so black hole formation itself is a whole tricky area of research that I don't know a super lot about. But um, my understanding is that you can form supermassive black holes by direct collapse, which means that you have a very high density of gas. And you can only really get that if it's concentrated kind of at the center of a dark matter halo. So I, I feel like it would be really uh, difficult to get that happening just kind of out in a diffuse part of the galaxy and not in the middle of a dark matter halo, which is at the center of the galaxy. Um, 
I get that it's confusing because the terms are very similar, but <laughs> it's actually a different different concept. So, um, essentially, when we observe galaxies that are in the very distant universe, if we look at them through, say, a red filter, okay, red in terms of the wavelength that we observe here on Earth, what we're seeing is light that was emitted in a bluer filter from that galaxy. And as it came toward us, the red shift in the expanding universe caused the light to stretch in wavelength, which made it look redder than it was when it was emitted. Okay, so that's kind of the connection. <laughs> Two different things. <laughs> continues to expand. So, yes, the universe is expanding, but structures like galaxy clusters and groups of galaxies are gravitationally bound, which means that they're not going to be ripped apart by the expansion of the universe. That is a weaker thing. And so, essentially, the space in between galaxy clusters will continue to increase as the universe progresses in time, but within the gravitationally bound cluster, things will still be gravitationally bound. Those will get ripped apart by the expansion of the universe. It's because the local gravity dominates over that expansion. Let's thank Grace once more. <laughs> Thanks again for coming out. We'll see you next month, November 14th on Wednesday. Back here at Tyler. Thanks for coming. <laughs>